sorry, producer dude. Here we go. You know, you have said, or other people have said, I have a big personality. And I know that's a nice way of saying something else. However, I think we have a guy who is like the personality. Like he's way before me. This guy's like an industry veteran. He's done all kinds of stuff. He has a mullet. And I don't know if we're going to get into this, but he has a mankini on a video. He did that. Like, I mean, the guy's got to be 50 some years old. He's in a mankini with a pink hat. Now you, you, that was my first introduction to this man. And, and by the way, what is his name? Say his name for me. <laughs> I'm probably going to get in trouble here. Pete Mania. Okay. Because okay, the musky man. I, I do want to point out, we've got him now ready to go, but we had a yeah. little trouble getting him going because Ross kept telling me his name was Pete Mania. Then he sent me an Mania. email that said Mania. You, so I, I mean, in fairness, if we're... The, hold on, hold on. <sighs> and I sent him the email to get go get the link to this. He didn't there get it go. because Ross sent me the wrong email. When he didn't get it, Ross sent him a link for another podcast. So Actually, if you check your phone, which we're probably going to have to do here, we're going to have to put some money on this. The correct name was given at the end and you didn't look at it. And then, yes, I sent him the wrong email for yet another podcast, but because you didn't do your job in the first place. All but right. I mean, I'm hoping that this podcast is going to go somewhere and bring it out of the ditch that we're in. Well, right we got now. him now. I see him. He's ready to go. So perfect. So, th yeah, I, I don't know where this is going to go. And this guy's like me. You're going to have to like jerk your shoulders, keep him on the tracks, I think. So without uh, any further ado, we're going to bring in the musky maniac himself, Mr. Pete Mania. Welcome back to the Big Water Podcast, Pete Mania. Is that pro is that proper? Because I can't spell it. It's you know, it's actually Mania, and that's why you can't spell it. Cause that's right, because I can't even say it. You want to call me the Maniac Mania, which I understand. You know, I've actually had that mistake for years and years. And that brings me right into the first thing. So when I told you, because I mean, we're kind of a walleye group. That's kind of what my guys are. But, you know, we've had everybody on you could ever imagine. And, you know, we like guys that are good at what they do, Mr. Pete. And uh, so when I started telling uh, my producer, like, hey, we want to have this musky guy. And he goes, a musky guy. And so I, I give him your info and he starts looking up and um, uh, producer, do you want to you want to tell him what your first question was for me? Uh, what's the deal with the mankini? <laughs> Oh gosh! You saw the mankini. That was my, first thing I saw. That was my introduction to you, Pete. That's what Ross sent me, and I went, "What? what what's going on?" That is brutal. That, is brutal. <laughs> that was kind of on a bet. I do this uh, gig, uh, Killing Winter, every spring for over a decade now, and I wear my pink hat and this, that, and the other. So I got challenged by boat company sponsor at the time joking around at an event that the next killing winter i need to wear a borat <laughs> mankini in pink and of course you know it, it's it's something you really shouldn't do i mean it's awful <laughs> it's terrible my father was embarrassed everybody there was embarrassed but uh i couldn't help it i had to do it so, so where did where here's the obvious question you people that don't know you me and you are both like about what six three are you about six three two we're six both three pretty tall. yeah you got an inch yeah. on me so but we're, we're tall pretty lean guys where does a guy that's six foot two find a mankini that's what i want to know right off the bat because if for right now if producer dude says hey this is a thousand dollar bet where do you even go about finding one that's that's the big question you find them online and i think it's kind of a one size fits all <laughs> in, in yesterday, an unbelievable yard ape with a huge belly. They're they're pretty stretchy. Let's just say they're not real kind to the lower unit. <laughs> well, we're looking at it right now. So, it, can, it, so can all we, that embarrassment when you did that and your dad and everybody. It's your poor wife coming back because we're showing it right now for your you. So poor if you're, wife. If you're uh, listening, go over to YouTube and check out Pete's Mankini. Oh God! So I want to get back to this pink thing. What is it like? You know, a lot of the girls like pink. Um, this pink hat thing. When I, you know, way before I knew you, I saw the pink. I don't even know what kind of hat it was. It had little bells and something coming off of it. But the pink significance. There's got to be some story to that, no? Well, believe it or not, there is a story behind it. I was actually uh, uh, trying to help out a aspiring musician who was also addicted to musky fishing, and it was kind of his deal 
originally these pink fuzzy hats. Okay. And so I would go around and do seminars wearing this hat and talking about this Brian Schramm guy and his fishing albums. At the time, he was writing fishing-related music. And it just kind of stuck. And then eventually, <laughs> I found someone. I was at the uh, Madison Fishing Expo. And there was a person there who made custom hats who had a pink fish hat. Uh, and at that point, I switched over because it's really cool. It got the little eyeballs and the and the little fish tail on it, and so that that has been the new pink hat for oh, about ten years now. Producer dude, I'm seeing a lot of similarities here between me and Pete. These some of these things don't really make. There's not a great story or make a lot of sense, but we just do it anyhow. Does this kind of sound like our deal? It it does. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of times I wonder what the hell you're doing too. So we're, yeah. Well, if you ever wonder, just watch Pete's uh, Killing Winner uh, video, and then all of a sudden I start looking almost normal. Well, maybe <sighs> maybe we'll put you in a mankini. Yeah, I, I already knew that was going to come up. So at any rate, let's get <laughs> back to the real <laughs> the real man man of the hour, Pete. So you're a musky guy. Give me give the people. You know, a lot of my crowd may not know. You know, they know probably about you because everybody knows Pete the musky guy. But give me a little like behind the scenes here because you know as we sit here. We're now in technology, 25, 30 years or whatever it's been, plus later you've been in the fishing business. How does a guy, I mean, I'm sure it's just like me, you always say, hey, I want to fish and I want to find a way to make a living fishing. But how has that become a reality for you kind of starting out of the gate? That was simply genetics, uh, somewhat bolstered by the fact that uh, I grew up on a fishing resort. And in those days, I mean, that's literally the only thing people who came to resorts did there was, you know, no jet skis or anything like that. They literally, everybody was fisher people. And, uh, I just, you know, from the first time I caught anything off the dock, I, I was absolutely addicted to it. I had my, uh, my folks still had the resort and I became a backup guide at the last minute with somebody being sick or something. I forget the exact, exact details there, but I, I went out and rode the boat around for guy and he caught a he caught a nice musky and gosh i got a i got a tip i got a pocket knife i got it, it was really kind of neat and uh i started guiding full-time at the age of 14 and just you know in reality i was supposed to go to college i did pretty well in school a lot of people are shocked by that but i was actually, me too yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was actually supposed to go to college and Told I would starve to death if I didn't, but I decided I had to make a living fishing. So I just, it, it, it started strictly with guiding and, and passion and just tons of time on the water. But that all built up to where by the, by the time I was in my early 20s, I was really kind of known for musky already then. I, I guided all species, but. By 19 or so, I actually had enough guiding business that I decided to do exclusively muskies while the muskie season was open. And it was a personal addiction. And then, you know, to to a certain extent, being multi-species is great. But when you really focus on one thing and, you know, if you get a good reputation with it, if you're doing well, it, it, it just really kind of kind of grew that's been my main focus i've always been an ice fisherman multi-species angler uh but i'm i'm known by far you know open water muskies uh you know is is really what the gig has been and and i never had a plan at all you know uh you and i talked about that a little bit but uh the whole idea was just to make a living and and uh young people ask me you know how do you do the business and this that and the other and you know the real answer is you struggle you just do everything that you possibly can and i uh didn't have any money i you know to buy boats and stuff like that and i bartended and pounded nails and trawled concrete and shoveled poop and whatever you know the the, the list of jobs was many but i uh I believe it was when I was 29, I actually no longer had a, a winter job of any kind. And at that point, I was able to completely let, make my living off of fishing. So, Yeah, that's. Uh, I remember you telling me uh, a little while back there about you had a, uh, 
a car that the doors rusted right off. You know, kids nowadays, you know, they, they roll into this thinking that they're going to be driving Denali's and all this stuff out of the gate. And it's like, nah, that's not usually how it kind of starts. At least not how did it help me and you did. No, no, I threw the door open on the truck to one day and there it was banging on the boat landing. <laughs> had, to, had to throw it in the back seat and weld it on later. You know how that is. Yeah, well, cars it, just don't rust. They don't rust anymore like like they used to. I, I mean, my dad had one that had a hole in the floor. You could see the road go by when I was growing up. They just don't <laughs> rust. Yeah, not as certain brands seem to more than others, but I, I would agree with that. So do you think people always ask me all the time, like, man, how come you didn't get into bass fishing, you know, and uh, it'd be so much easier and you make so much more money. And truthfully, I hate, I call them, um, you know, ditch pickles or green carp or whatever, but I grew up on the shores of Lake Erie. So, you know, that's kind of walleye central and it has been forever. You know what I mean? Like that's, the, you're not into marlin fishing, you know, when you grew up on, on the shores of Lake Erie. And is that kind of the same for you? Because people that don't know you're around the Hayward area, right? Which is like, I mean, that's like musky lore. Isn't there a fishing hall of fame or yes. something right there? Yeah, that, you know, I, I think that's a big part of it too. Everything's arguable. Uh, but, you know, I think northern Wisconsin in general, and especially the, the Hayward area, has just always been the musky lore deal. And, and there's been a battle for years over who's the actual musky capital of the world between Hayward and Boulder Junction. But, yeah, it's, it, it's just what it's known for. And I think uh, years ago, uh, the musky fisheries have expanded quite a bit. There were a few natural fisheries in Minnesota, but not a whole pile of them. There's Leech Lake and some different places, but most of the fisheries there are stock fisheries. The same thing to a certain extent in Michigan, where northern Wisconsin just had all kinds of natural musky water. The rivers, uh, tons of the inland lakes, and basically anyone who wanted to go musky fishing from certainly the Chicago area, Twin Cities area nearby, I mean, that was that was the place to go. I mean, we were it. You know, and much more so than any place else in the world. So I think, you know, just that idea that uh, there was probably fifty uh, percent of the people that came to the Hayward area. While you can fish panfish and bass and walleyes, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of other species here. But you know, the the big big focus was musky, and it it seemed like the most hype thing as well. But personally, I just I really got into it. You know, you have these little personal things that hit you, and it's like, I got to be the best at this and catch the the most of these and the biggest of these, if at all possible. And, you know, that was just kind of my my goal, what I was striving for at first. And, uh, well, I mean, I think back in the day, because we had Al Linder on the podcast a little while ago, and he talked about, uh, Tad, do you remember it was either his uncle or someone in his family, it was his grandparents that had a uh, a family place on a small lake up around Hayward. And so they would go from Chicago to go up there. And that's where a lot of people with money out of the cities went, right? And and they went to fishing resort land. And so you almost had some built-in clientele. It was kind of like us. It was a destination place. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the lenders used to fish grindstone a ton, which is only about uh, 30 minutes up the road for me. I fish it quite a bit. Grindstone and Couturier are connected together. And uh, they, they mainly fish grindstone, from what I understand, and then a little bit on coudere. But, yeah, they spend a lot of time over this way. So I'm, I'm interested for my own um, hey. sp sp Sparky over there. Uh, yeah. You know, it's like me. I, I'm sure that my uh, my high school English teacher, you know, was rolling in her grave as she sees some of my stuff or whatever. But now, you know, I write for a lot of magazines and I wrote a book and I've seen you, you know, you've got to put the pen down a lot or, and, and worked with a lot of stuff like that. And, you know, I see a lot of seminars and things that you do. And for the guys out there, especially the younger kids, all this college fishing thing, I mean, I think I already know your answer, but, you know, a guy like you that doesn't have any formal training like that, like, how do you just roll into, you know, this is what we're going to do seminars and it, it, articles. it's actually, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, I believe it or not, uh, taught myself how to type on an old, uh, man. I don't know if they call it manual or whatever, but the old, old typewriter, uh, when I was started asked to start writing articles, I literally didn't know how to type. I could have taken that in high school and I didn't cause I was thinking I'm going to fish who needs to type. <laughs> and uh, you know, there it, it was really in my in my mid twenties already. All of a sudden, I you know I was gaining enough notoriety that people were asking me to do seminars and write articles, and 
I did a tremendous amount of writing. I don't do a, a whole lot at this stage. Uh, I think, you know, social media time has just taken up a lot of that. And uh, But I I got pretty proficient at it, wrote a couple of books as well. Uh, actually, uh, uh, two serious ones and two uh, musky suck books, which are fun ones. But, about, uh, that's yeah, a good title, musky sucks. I like that. Yeah, well, it's uh, it, it's caught on over the years, and in reality, you know, I, I really got the idea just from the fact that you know it, it is a crazy addiction, and it really you know affects lives and relationships, and some of the funny angles on that. After all of the how to and where to and stuff that I'd done, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna just kind of tell the story of you know basically getting addicted to them and how you end up only hanging around other addicted people and. You know, it, uh, it, it it pretty much affects everything in your life when you're literally 24-7 every day. You know, average day was 16 hours when I was younger. That's part of the reason I caught a lot of fish, or just doing it all the time, right? So, uh, you know, guiding wasn't enough. I, I do double days sometimes, but if I only had a single job, it wasn't like I was done musky fishing. I was back at it. So how is a guy like yourself there? I'm not trying to dig you because, I mean, people say the same thing about me, but do you just decide one day, hey, I'm going to write a book and you do it yourself? Or do you kind of partner with somebody to help kind of put, because there's, having written one, I don't think people understand. There is so much that goes into it. I mean, like as an example, something I learned because I self-published mine was you have to figure out what weight paper you're going to use, how many pages you have to put that together. And then there's a formula to see how high that's going to be so that you, then you can design your, the spine of the book. You know what I mean? It's these things you just don't yeah. think about. It's, it's not just putting something down and into some program or something that, you know, which they might not even had when you started doing some of your first stuff, but there's so much that goes into it. And I'm wondering just how you like said, boom, you know, <laughs> well, it's uh, the two serious books were through fishing hotspots uh, years ago. And a guy by the name of Russ Wary, uh, actually edited those and and put them all together and took care of all of that end of it for me with regard to the musky suck books i did all the writing myself and basically all the editing but i did work with uh on the first one with uh steve hiding at at musky hunter magazine at the time that he worked for and he he handled some of those details of what you're talking about i basically just you know wrote it did the pictures and and uh I, I handled the illustrations with the guy and went over things, but, uh, you know, as far as actually producing the book itself, those details I left up to him. There's a lot of time and stuff that goes into that, ain't there? Like, oh, oof. yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the most intriguing things I have is, is the when you started a musky lure company. And I don't know any about this other than just, you know, I think I still have some of those lures. But, again, how, how does that take place? You roll into... Hey, doing seminars. Here's another way to make a buck. These lures suck. I'm going to make my own. Is that kind of how that goes? Yeah. In reality, it's kind of funny with, with that. Uh, you know, I hadn't told you this. I I basically spent about eh, five, six years with the idea uh, banging around in my head, more from clients than anything. They were like, oh, you got to make lures. You got to make lures. I'm, I'm not going to make lures. Everybody makes lures, blah, blah, blah. My favorite baits by far just because you're the one that imparts the action into the lure is jerk baits i always still to this day i really enjoy it uh more than anything obviously you gotta let the fish tell you what's what they're in the mood for but i've always loved jerk baits and there weren't near as near as many baits on the market in those days there was only a handful of them and there were none that were plastic and there was only one other company I believe at the time making any kind of uh, uh, plastic musky baits. That was Joe Booker, and but there was no jerk baits, and I most of the jerk baits were big and some you know varying degrees of hardness of wood, but the the hooking percentages were lousy, and I literally because the musky clamp their teeth in there doesn't matter how hard you set the hook if they actually get their teeth into wood with a big round bait. You're not going to move that bait. You can set the hook till you're blue in the face, but at the end of Never. the day, when they decide to open their mouth, it comes out. So th that was my big premise, and and so I had to kind of eat my words with all of my clients. 
but I told them I was never going to start a lure company. I, that was <laughs> actually about a, uh, a year and a half hiatus. I, when I decided to do it, I got one quote for a mold, and it was $30,000. And I said, well, there's no way in heck I could possibly afford that. So I brushed it off again. Nobody else was doing it. And then I got a little more serious about it and uh, started getting different quotes. And I got a little more reasonable quote. I, I believe my first mold was like 12 grand and just started the business from there. And then, uh, it, you know, it, it's going pretty good. I added a couple lures and then I literally had some retailers. So, so hold, hold up, hold up. What I should make. Hold, hold up. So, cause I, I, you know, what I do is totally different, but I can follow this whole process. So, did you make one out of something else? Because, you know, once you do the tooling, kind of the tooling is the tooling. So you had to have figured something out, you know, because this is way before 3D printing, right? So how did you get I, to that? I sent a, a mold maker basically three different baits. And my ideas are the first lure. And then I literally was working with them over the phone with drawings and this, that, and the other. And then essentially... You know, we got it to the point where I I forget what the uh, test mold was. It wasn't a final mold, uh, and it wasn't that expensive. So it was a few hundred bucks. We came to agreement with everything. Let's let's do that and uh, run a test mold on it. I was quite relieved, actually, that that first test mold, uh, I got it and used it, and I'm like, yeah, let's go. Uh, so that's, that's basically how it worked. But... Uh, but yeah, I did not craft because it was a concave face and, you know, I couldn't get it perfect. So it was it was literally a matter of uh, a hybrid bait idea that, you know, we we just worked out together over the phone and through drawings and then that test mold. You got to meet the right people at the right time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And of course, then you go through that's that's the good thing about the plastic you've got different chambers in there and then you know we could mess around with weighting and we perfected some of that and then you know i actually uh had a couple different models of it a more buoyant and a sinker and blah 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 but uh yeah that's a that, that there is nothing easy about that either you know and that's something i still do to this day for uh several different companies is help design and fine-tune lures uh it's just about never a process that you uh you know you 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 build it and it's right you know you gotta you gotta keep going yeah. and going and testing and trying different materials and weights and blah 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 so as a guy that's guiding and doing the promotions and all that stuff that goes around it i love how people always tell me Nick, so what do you do in your time off i'm like a what a what time you know <laughs> when you're when you own a lure company now I mean, now you are 24 seven. So did that just get to be too much time away? Cause I mean, it's really hard to fish and run a lure company, right? Oh, I, yeah, it was, it was a very chaotic time. I mean, I, you know, that next 15 years when everything's growing, I'm getting more and more speaker engagements, more writing, more blah, 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 more TV opportunities all the while trying to figure out how much I could keep guiding and possibly run the business and eventually i uh with the lure business that was really taking off and i did have to start hiring people i eventually changed mold makers uh after i met this gentleman it's it's really a very long story but uh he eventually became my partner and helped me run the company after i after i got to know him real well and uh and we we grew it. We grew it fast. We uh, we were the largest musky lure company out there for the two final years before I sold the or we sold the company. Yeah, that's just that. That's it's, I can appreciate that. There's just so much going on, and just you know, whether it's trade shows or dealer shows or Rufus barking at you. <laughs> yeah, that's Maven, by the way. Maven, our, our new standard poodle puppy who is trying to be on the podcast. I apologize for that. Can I beat her in front of you? Or, you know, there's a couple of things you don't want to do. You don't want to drink angel tears and you don't want to beat baby seals on camera. I can, I can edit it out. Yeah, I can edit it out if you do. Producer dude is amazing. He can do amazing things. But 
So the musky, I mean, were you relieved or is that kind of like bittersweet? Because when you put that much blood, sweat and tears into kind of putting your name behind something and that, I mean, that had to be huge for putting your name out there, right? Like that's another level of, of, of you're a guide, but now you're just, you're like the dude. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, it, it, it did a lot because we, uh, we, we did well overseas as well. And we were, uh, <laughs> you know, really, really big with the pike crowd over there. There was a, there was a lot of stuff going on with that. Maven! <laughs> Stop it. Okay. <laughs> that was just a slight beating. I apologize for that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it, it really did a lot. And, and the, the decision to sell, which I regret, I honestly, it's very interesting. You know, you and I've talked a little bit about how this industry has grown, but I also made a pretty bad business mistake when I really think about it. I honestly thought at the time, to a certain extent, this thing is kind of peaking. Uh, we, we came to a crossroads with painting. We did not control our own painting. Everything else we could control. Uh, my partner, Ben, was tremendous at quality control. Uh, you know, he personally cared, obviously, as an owner, he cares even more. Uh, we, we we really did a tremendous job, in my opinion, on, on putting great baits out with everything. But we did have issues with painting. Uh, we would have, uh, you know, you're, you're growing and you're using different painters and you'd have painters that would change clear coat or paint or whatever, not tell you, not test it. Not I, I mean, you should have heard some of my phone conversations. I'm like, my God, can't you? carve these lures with a knife down to the plastic and soak them in water for a while. You just put them in a damn package and send them out. Cause there were the, nothing drove me nuts more than having a bad batch of baits go out. And it's, it's bad for business. I mean, you might replace them, but to a certain, you, you got X amount of customers who are just going to say, well, this, you know, this tackle company sucks and I'm not going to buy it again. So we, we literally, it was, it was a combination of, the timing where we got a pretty good offer. Neither one of us wanted to start a paint facility and deal with the EPA and all these different things. And I very mistakenly thought that maybe the, uh, the lure business had somewhat peaked and, and was getting kind of clogged. And I was completely wrong on that one. But uh, yeah, it was, it, it was tough to let it go, to be real honest with you. I got a funny paint story for you just happened a couple weeks ago so yeah. i've got i got a couple of guys that get on a guide trip got a couple boats going on and uh the guy in the other uh the other boat comes over to me and he says hey he said i brought this big box of lures for you and it was kind of weird because you know he'd asked me hey what are we going to be using and all this stuff beforehand and i you know i was you know kind of like you musky guys i'm a little gun shy now i'm like where's this guy going with this and i so i gave him a little bit up and told him hey we know we're using this kind of finishes and, and things like that and so this guy brings this i mean when i say a box i mean he brought boxes okay of lures and uh i'm like well, what are you doing with all this he goes hey can i bring these in your boat i want to run some of these and i'm like dude my boat is full of tackle and the long and the short of it is i started looking at these things and i'm like i said dude you run those when you're in the other boat tomorrow so my other my other captain guy that's running these guys the next day, they go through and they're not catching anything. And so my guy calls me on the phone. He goes, hey, are you still catching them? They look pretty busy over there. I said, we're murdering them. We're catching them. He goes, I haven't caught a single fish. So at the end of that day, that guy shows me these baits. And I said, hey, how much do you trust these things floating? He's like, what do you mean? And, you know, this again, this is an aspiring lure, whatever you want to call yeah. it. I take one and I throw it in the lake. And he's like, what are you doing? I go, oh, they float, right? The thing went right to the bottom. And just to your point, they were using such so much paint and clear over these lures that they had a bait that should have been neutrally, you know, buoyant, and it made it sink. And and so he's got boxes, you know, thousands, probably a couple thousand dollars worth of lures. And I just looked at him, I go, you do realize all of those are completely jack they're junk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it, there's 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 so many minute little details with that uh, lure building thing and i'm sure you've uh, you've experienced that like you said some of the processes we've both been involved in with lure development it takes forever it seems like because the nuances is, is this the minute differences between catching and not catching is huge i mean is that fair yeah absolutely so so you you kind of regret now you regret it because of money because you don't seem like a money guy to me, or do you regret it because 
You just would have had to do less of other things. I would, I would say, you know, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't money. Uh, but, but it was just more of the idea of letting it go, you know? Uh, and, and I didn't, it made sense when we did it strictly from a business standpoint, I guess, to a certain extent, but yeah. Yeah. Especially after a little time went by, I was kind of like, you know, I really wish I wouldn't have done it. But he said the same thing, you know, but, uh, you know, at that point it is what it is. Right. And, and, and you move on it. Uh, it was, it was nice to, to get that off, uh, off my shoulders directly though, you know? And, uh, so, you know, you, you the big, the big business decision, you don't even probably know this one that I made that actually was good for my career, but I decided to get in the, uh, magazine business. Oh, Right about the time the internet hit. <laughs> this, this does Tad, this does not sound good. Yeah. So you want to talk about financial wounds. Uh, yeah, that was a significant one. But uh, I, I started a, a international magazine called uh, Esox Angler. It was uh, Pike and Muskie. And we literally had writers from all over the world and... Uh, we still to this day get get people uh, talking about it and accolades on the great publication we had. And uh, the whole premise behind it was to uh, really hammer on truth, handling, conservation, and, and basically try and make a difference on the North American continent as far as the, the pike. It was kind of, that's why part of the reason I mixed the Europeans in, because over there, pike is what they have. Now, they... They do have bigger pike uh, genetically than than grow over here, but on that continent, yeah, they they get to be fifty pounds over there. But they didn't have any muskies, so they idolized the pike there, with some exceptions on the North American con- continent. You know, pike are not idolized; they're they're like a trash fish to quite a few people. And I did not. We were trying to amazing. bridge that gap and and do a lot of different things but the timing of it was just real poor and and actually we talked about the lenders earlier they were so nice obviously they had a lot of experience they had uh, they had sold the infish deal and and uh they gosh i had three or four different meetings with them but they did they did warn me they tried to help me as much as possible but they you know they they explained the newsstand part of it and all these different things and they you know they said you're going to go through a lot of money and a lot of effort to get somewhere with it and uh it it was it was a combination of a lot of things but yeah we we literally uh closed it down because of finances I do remember that magazine, and I did not know that was yours. How long did you guys actually do that? Oh, gosh, uh, too long. Uh, (laughs) uh, (laughs) 12 years, I believe. Oh, no kidding? That's that's a long time. We made a we made a good run, and 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 it was a great magazine, and and uh, arguably one of the greatest uh, pack of writers uh, assembled. I I think. I mean, we had we had amazing group of people from overseas we had some guys from russia a whole bunch from the 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 uk and uh in germany and yeah it was a it was a neat mix holland so it it was it was a good idea and a good product but it would just you know if we could have transitioned it real smartly if somebody on the team would have been uh super internet savvy and you know i think we could have rolled it over into an internet thing and kept it going but the whole paper thing i think was you know just a real tough knot especially with the timing when you're dumping a whole bunch of money into it when it's getting totally antiquated and everything's going on the internet right well if it makes you feel any better there's a lot of companies that did not do a good transition i mean like i think about like sports illustrated or you could even argue like field and stream and outdoor life right now are kind of suffering that same blow um yeah it's almost like the companies had to reinvent themselves to the go straight to digital but so you you brought up something there that i think is is a good one because i watch a lot of your craziness and um you know the which I actually like because me and you are both crazy guys, but I think most people would say that, you know, we're both, we kind of wear it on our sleeve. Like you don't have to wonder what either one of us are thinking. Right. And 
you know, you do a lot with the release and the musky care and stuff like that. And it's just funny because from my own deal, I'll actually get people giving me shit because I'm doing release videos on walleyes. And I don't know where we went, you know, in my world. And I'm, I'll transition transition this to you quickly. But it's like, you know, largemouth. If you keep one, you're going to die. And the same thing, like most right. musky guys, it, if, if someone keeps a musky, they're, they're going to be shot. They're going to yeah. slash their tires. In my world, I'm getting shit because I'm doing a release video in a wallet. Like, I don't know because they taste good. I don't know how this does a 180. I have no idea. But it's funny too, because, you know, you, I won't put words in your mouth, but I've seen a lot of your videos where you're like, Hey man, don't fish for these things when the water is this warm, because you're going to kill them. Even though you let them go, don't mean shit. And I see the same thing in my boat. People donk them. They drop a fish 10 times and they throw it over the side. Like, oh, look at that nice release. And it's like, you just, that fish is just, you just delayed the murder of him basically, you know? And so, I mean, has that fish care or things like that, have you gotten a lot of negative feedback because of that? Well, here again, it all depends on uh, uh, the location, I guess, to a certain extent and, uh, and, and the people you're dealing with. But uh you know, like Europe, I got, I got basically famous over there with the pikers, uh, especially when we had that magazine going and I was getting into a lot of that stuff, Ross. It was, it was unbelievable. The accolades, I don't know how many different languages my writings were translated into about care and handling a fish over there. Uh, and, you know, over here, I would say it, it, to a certain extent, depended on the crowd. But anytime... I, I, I've always been real vocal on it, and, and and I try and tell people when I'm talking about it that all of the stuff that I talk about, it's not like it's not like I'm perfect. I did all the bad things. I I used to use gut hooks with live bait. Well, heck, the first four years I musky guided, we we killed them all. In those days, they you know it was a 32 inch size limit, and and that was just what everybody did, right? I, I guess that was the first you know hill I tried to climb was, you know, getting on the release thing. Not that I was standing alone in that, but, uh, you know, pushing that, pushing higher size limits. Then there was, uh, you know, the, the live bait thing was real popular in Wisconsin and everybody used gut hooks, no quick strike rigs. And then I, you know, I really started attacking that and you, you run into a little bit of ego, a little bit of, you know, people just not wanting to change their ways, a little bit of people not wanting to experiment with something new. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I would always try and remind people that, you know, and I, frankly, I think there's really not nearly enough people who are making a living at this, whether it be companies, guides, pros, whatever you want to call any of us, not really appreciating because at the end of the day, we we never like to talk about it all that much. It seems like people that make a living in the industry, but uh, you know, we want to talk about the latest graph or the hot lure or the line or whatever. But at the end of the day, what are we all really looking for, Ross? We're looking for healthy fishers. Doesn't matter if you're chasing walleyes or whatever. What what lakes do you choose or rivers do you choose to go on? You know, if you're targeting walleye. You know, you just happen to be probably on the best walleye fishery ever uh, on this continent. But, you know, obviously that's what you're looking for. Right. And, uh, you know, if you're 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 essentially cutting your own throat. It's my uh, 401k. <laughs> you know. I know I, the walleye guys are not up to speed with that, man. I don't know. They just like and the funny thing is, is like we get guys from your neck of the woods, you know, that come over here and they'll release every single fish they catch in Wisconsin. But they come here and they want to see how many 30 inches they can eat Be, beyond. I don't get it. I just, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just like people that win the lot. Look at like the lottery. You know, they say like 70 percent of the people that win the lottery go broke. You know what I mean? Just because you got a lot of something don't mean it ain't going to go bye bye. But I'll, I'll get off that soapbox for a producer dude strangles me because we've talked about this before quite a bit. But <laughs> I think I would be not doing either one of us justice. Now, I'm not going to blindside you here. But the funny thing is, is when you've been in the business as long as you have and I've been in it 20 plus years is you get buddies that know each other. Like so I have some friends that are friends with you. And they, you know, when they're like, hey, you're going on the Big Water podcast, like you should probably ask Pete if he's ever run out of gas before. And I'm like, and I go, what What do you mean? Like, and he's like, just ask him, has he ever run out of gas before? Apparently, there's a story there. Do you want to share? 
gosh, I don't, I don't know which one. It's, it's probably. You've run out of gas multiple times. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, no, actually, not as much as uh, some other people I know that have been doing it a long time. I, I believe I only uh, have two pretty distinct ones, but uh, the most recent one, I basically didn't believe it and didn't want to admit it. Now, the only thing I had backing me up at all on this whole deal is that technically my gas gauge was not working at the time, but I should have known better. Let's just put it that way. And there was much chatter in the boat as to what was causing the problems with the outboard. And uh, I was basically saying that it couldn't possibly be that we were out of fuel. And we were. At, so at, produ at, producer, at, producer dude. Story, but, yeah. Producer dude, me and you have never run out of gas together, knock on wood. But So I could see where there might be some discrepancies here. But... They also said that they, I should ask you if you've ever had a stalker. Now, <laughs> now I mean, you know, see the look on your face. Now there's no discrepancies. Now we are we on the same page on this one? You know, this is what happens when you have dirty friends like we have. Yeah, yeah. That's that's just. Uh, I that, I may have had something that could qualify as that. But that's something we're just not going to get into. <laughs> I mean, anything to do with fishing lures or ladies or stalkers or anything? I don't know. It, I, you, you know, you, you're, it's your buddy, not mine. It's, you know what I mean? It's your buddy. Yeah, I could, yeah, it's great to have friends, isn't it? Yeah, they're terrible. But I, here's a story about you. What I'll, I'll tell you a little bit that um, I used to sell boats when I first started in the business, and that was kind of my thing that helped me get, you know hang on long enough you know what i mean one of those deals and uh i used to do some stuff because again mutual friends with a guy over in sturgis michigan by the name of mark zona <laughs> and he was a boat salesman too yeah i think i know it's that a, guy it's a small world huh i know you fished with him i bet you you know i've been told that guys like me and you are have big personalities that's the word they use when they don't want to say something else um, I was just going to say that. That's the nice way of putting it. Yeah, Ted, Ted do, you want, do you want to comment any further on that? Or? <laughs> no, I think you covered it. It's the nice okay. way of saying obnoxious. No, I don't think we're obnoxious. I just think we're, I mean, I mean, maybe if I wore a mankini in the pink hat, ran around outside and throwing dynamite at a snowman, maybe that's obnoxious. I don't know, but I like it, right? So you and Zona in the boat, I haven't seen this footage, but that has to be that's a whole lot of personality right there oh yeah by the way i just caught up with zona for the first time in a while I had a chat with him today and yeah, it was good to catch up with the dude but uh yeah when we we did not really know each other at all it was a uh mutual friend who had uh well he was he was filming zona's new show World's greatest fishing show. Zona's always been kind of, you know, low key. <laughs> I, thought, I thought any guy that names his show the world's greatest fishing show, I, I got to meet, right? So I, <laughs> yeah, I jumped on it. My buddy Greg Underdahl told me a little bit about Mr. Zona. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, at the time, uh, the Bay of Green Bay was uh, really, really starting to go as a musky fishery. And uh, we talked a little bit and, uh, you know, set some dates. And, uh, yeah, the rest is the rest is kind of history. We became buddies after that. But it was kind of interesting because I was uh, – we were using uh, my boat and uh, had everything rigged up and ready, same company. So everything was cool with all of that. And I didn't realize Zona was there in the parking lot of the hotel. And I've got, I'm just prepping stuff with the boat. We were going to go out trolling muskies on the Bay of Green Bay. And I got my truck doors wide open and I'm working and I got, uh, well, I got music going. And all of a sudden I hear this voice, Crocus, I love Crocus. Oh, <laughs> look at that hair. We're going to get along <laughs> He started in, and I was just like, whoa, now this guy, I like him. And we just, yeah, we really hit it off. We had a 
we had a great day out there. It was it was kind of interesting um, because about at eh, twenty minutes into it, we hadn't caught a fish yet. But I'm running pile of lines. I don't I don't think Zone had ever seen anybody running that many musky baits around trolling. Well, maybe he hadn't seen musky baits at all. I guess at the time, but uh, he started joking around on the show, calling me man genius as I was running out all these lines and. <laughs> all this stuff going. and he just kept on it and i i had music going in the boat actually the guy i talked about with the pink hat earlier i had some brian shram fishing music going and we were trolling around and we ended up catching a pile of fish i mean the the bite was good the fish were still fairly stupid to be perfectly honest and we were on him a, a, a buddy of mine had clued me in at, at what was going on actually i had not actually gone there and done it in that area he just said if you you know if you know what you're doing trolling and you do this and you know we just we just went there and really really got it done zona got like a, a at least a 40 pound fish uh but we got you know we got seven or eight which for muskies is unbelievable and i think we only actually fished about eight hours and but it was you know it was just a trip being with zona and all the man genius thing and what really impressed me with the music. I had the loud music going, of course, and all of a sudden, Zona goes into a... Uh, how, wait a minute. How, how, producer, producer, dude, are you hearing this? If we had loud music going, wouldn't wouldn't per production, wouldn't, wouldn't they go nuts with the music playing? If it were loud enough, yeah. yeah we would, it would be kind of hard to produce uh, video, yeah. I'm just saying because I would like to play some gangster rap well, while we're going. I, I just possible. want to point out, what did, what did I tell you? And I didn't know Pete at all. And what did I say? He looks like he likes hair metal. And then he just popped out Crocus. I mean. Yeah, I, it was the mullet that gave it away, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you you and Zona together. I mean, I just like, I'm still just kind of like thinking about the insanity. I, I, I'm going to have to try to dig this clip up. Oh, God. Yeah. He, so, went, I, this, so this music, he, he started he started doing the drums and his head is going all over the place and it's unbelievable. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he grabs a bottle of water, basically <laughs> dumps it all in his mouth to make it look like he's spitting fire and he spits it all over. <laughs> and that's when I realized this is one unique character right here. <laughs> I could just see producer dude yelling at me. That's my microphone. Get the water. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. So is it, is there any other personalities? Cause I know you fished with a lot of famous people. I've seen like uh, just recently on your Instagram or whatever you had, which me and you haven't talked about, but Christian Leitner, the old basketball guy. Um, I can remember Lonnie Stanley, the old bass professor or whatever his title was back then, the jig guy. Like who's who sticks out as a guy that, you know, you enjoyed sharing the boat with or just insanity, you know, because like as a guide, man, I've have literally hundreds of stories of just whether it's famous people or people that nobody knows and just insanity happening or something funny as hell. Yeah, well, you I, I mean, as far as funny as hell uh exciting crazy uh flubs to a certain extent i mean i don't know how you could possibly beat zona but a a, a close second is uh, john gillespie who i've been filming with for 30 years now. <laughs> he's a, he's a handful he is an unbelievable trip a, a goal in my life i still they're both so busy but i absolutely have to get zona and gillespie together somehow there would be no way to speak during that show. You would not oh, no. be able to get a word in edgewise. No, no, no. I just put a bag over my head with a couple of eyeball holes and yeah, just watch because there's no <laughs> sense in even trying to get a word in edgewise. They'd, they'd be trying to outdo one another. It'd be great. I could just imagine it. But uh, yeah, I mean, for that kind of thing, you couldn't possibly beat those guys. They're both just unbelievably unique. And then uh, now Leitner, he's kind of interesting in that in that. Uh, you know, the basketball career thing, arguably he's the best college player ever, you know, and uh, his Duke deal was just unbelievable, but obviously Olympic gold medals and, uh, and 13 years in the pros. And, uh, but he, with all of that on basketball, he does not, you can't get him to talk about basketball. He's not interested in talking about anything about his career, anything about basketball. You got to pry it out of him. 
uh, when when I got Gillespie filming with him as well, I mean, he was he was right away trying to get him to talk about his career. He didn't want to talk about any of that. He wants to talk muskies, and he's he's just like a he, he he's not a crazy type personality like Zona or Gillespie. But the neatest thing, and it's kind of weird when you got a seven foot tall guy who's like that. The the passion of this guy with fishing is, is, is really pretty amazing. He's like a huge little kid. Uh, when every time he gets the fish and while he's doing it, you just see the, the sheer joy of doing it the whole time. And the excitement and the smiles every time he gets one. And he's definitely not a selfish angler at all either. He's had his, uh, stretches fishing with me where, He's been the one catching them, but he's had stretches where he hasn't been. Unfortunately, there's some people they get a little grumpy if there's two, three fish going in the boat and, and they're not the one involved with it. Producer did not say anything. Yeah. <laughs> he's happy for everyone and just enjoying his time out there. So he got addicted, by the way, uh, the muskies when he was with the Minnesota Timberwolves, the strength and conditioning coach there. When he first joined the team was a musky angler who had a place on Lake of the Woods. And this guy, Saul Brandes, took Christian up after asking him a couple times, you want to come try it? And, you know, it was just like me telling my story. And, and obviously you people like us that are addicted genetically, he just got up there. He tried it once. Didn't even catch one the first time. But, you know, the rest was history. He just he just loved the Canadian Shield. He loved Lake of the Woods. He loved just seeing those muskies. and been doing it ever since and that's all he does now he's he still does basketball camps for kids but he'll as much as possible he tries to plan all of his basketball camps in areas that have muskies so he's fishing prior really? and after uh all of his camps that he organizes that's interesting i don't know about you so pete real quick you know what you know you mentioned he fell in love with muskies you fell in love with muskies why I mean, why muskies i mean it to me i mean to me it's the most boring fishing ever you know i mean i i, I just i, I we just saw curious. we saw one today guys that's yeah, a win I mean, really yeah i mean it's a win that's what's cool about muskies right there there's one answer what other species can you fish for where you still have something to talk about and be proud about if you had follows you can be absolutely skunked but musky fishermen get to go home, go to the bar, wherever it might be, back to the resort, and they can count follows and talk about follows and misses. Nobody else can do that. I'm a producer, dude. I know you'd be ripping me. You'd be ripping uh, me up right I, I now. already have it. Yeah, talking about misses. Yeah, I mean, <sighs> Ross talks about misses a lot. Yeah. I mean, so producer dude, I mean, don't you think like a guy with as much personality, I mean, the guy wears a mankini and a pink hat. Like, I feel like he has some stories he's holding out on us a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean dude's got a long flowing locks from his, you know what I mean? For sure. There's gotta be something in there that he's, he's just kind of like, I mean, he, he's, you know, he doesn't want to talk about the, the stalkers and running out of gas. I understand that. I understand that. Uh, but they're, they're about running out of gas. Stalkers are just not that, all that interesting to me. You know? <laughs> I, there's whole shows on that. But I would I would argue that. <laughs> I mean, I could see why you wouldn't want to talk about that, but I think me and like producer dude and like I don't know every single person that listens to this podcast would be like, oh my gosh. But I mean, in all seriousness, though, I mean, I um, you you have street cred for obviously not just catching fish, but you know I, I actually know a few things because again you've been in the business long enough, and I know you turned down a deal that was paying some good money, and so it's things like that where I respect you more than anything. It's not how many muskies you've caught, you know. Like I turned down a deal a few years ago that was like I don't care what you're doing. You're like man, this is a really good business decision as far as financially, and you know looking back now. Um, they just didn't have good stuff to be point blank. And that's why they were off for the numbers. You know what I mean? Now the company is basically no longer around anymore. So you go, I think I made the right decision, even though there's a lot of guys out there, not just new guys, not just young guys, a lot of older guys, even that was said, Hey, I would have cashed that check for X, you know, one, two, three years or whatever, and put that in, but you're not that type of dude. And I mean, you've, I know you've run across one of those and I don't want you to say the name or anything like that, but I mean, some, some of that stuff that you've had, if you want to talk about, you know, just how the, the difference with credibility in the industry nowadays. 
Yeah, well, it's it, it's just really important to me, and and obviously you as well. I mean, at the end of the day, I I, I have a pretty simple rule. I've got a great relationship with my dad, Tex. Uh, he's the one that uh, bought the resort and basically, you know, got me into fishing in many ways. And uh, I always tell myself if I'm representing a product that I would not tell Tex to go buy with his own money, then I shouldn't be representing that product. And just ethically, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that uh, I've experienced and I, I, I try to play it straight. I, I never, I, you know, I'm sure that uh, in some cases it's happened, but I don't, you know, I don't ever want to hear from anybody out there that made a purchase because of something Pete Mayna said and they're pissed off you know they had a bad experience and that's that very simply that's just the way i look at it you know if i wouldn't go out and buy it if i wouldn't tell my dad to buy it if i wouldn't tell my best friend to buy it why would i stand there and give a little speech saying this is a great product and you ought to go buy it uh it's just uh something I've, I've really tried to avoid now you, you know there's middle ground in a lot of these things i don't think there's any company that's absolutely perfect uh but obviously there's an attitude behind companies that they want to they want to do the right thing if they do have problems they want to immediately fix those problems and they want to take care of any consumer that got a bummer deal uh you know out of their mistake whatever it might be and uh, it, it just it, it just doesn't pay. I I don't think in the long run, actually, from a financial standpoint, certainly too the with with having overall credibility over, especially when you're doing this for decades, the people that do follow you, uh, you know, you I I want their respect. You know, I I want them to know that you know the if I say something good about a particular product, they're going to be able to say, all right, well. I'm going to go buy it and try it. You know, if, if Pete uses it, he's probably not lying to me. So hundred percent. That's, that's why I respect you more. Cause I don't want to care about muskies at all. To be honest with you. <laughs> but I, I think we need to, we need to end this with something because as producer would say, we are two big personalities, maybe not Zona big, but big personalities. Could you leave us with like a Pete mania, like, thought of the day or i mean i always ask guys this and they always kind of stumble and we probably have to edit half of it out yeah, producing gosh, like, you're hitting but, me with hard stuff Holy I mean, oh. it's easy stuff i mean for a guy that wears a pink hat and a mankini like he's gonna are you, are you gonna stumble oh i don't know i don't think i'm gonna stumble and fall down i'm fine <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't have any wise words to leave us with like well, one, really, uh, the, uh, maybe a tip from pete a tip from pete uh would be to uh all of you for whatever species you fish for is pay more attention to what's making your bobber sink or your rod bounce whatever you want to put it i i really i i really am still strong with all species and frankly especially walleyes, because I, I I see that is the single most harvested fish around here as well. But either way, you know, re remember what the actual enjoyment is about and, and get serious about conservation and actually, uh, you know, learning learning how to handle and properly release and not bounce fish around. There's, you know, we, we could do a 10-minute seminar on all of this and go through tools and a bunch of things, but prioritize that in your own mind i mean people people seem to be way more worried about the the latest bestest graph uh lures the you know the real sexy stuff that's going to catch you more fish fast at the end of the day healthy fisheries are going to catch you more fish and it, if you care at all about your neighbor and you got kids or whatever it might be grandkids whatever the case may be if you want them to be able to do it and enjoy it that's you know that's something you really want to concentrate on. If you do harvest eating fish isn't a dirty word, but use common sense when you're harvesting. You know, I always suggest to people that, uh, you know, you take the fish species in the fishery. That's the healthy, healthiest, obviously, population wise, but also, you know, the, the size structure that is most prevalent 
you know, try to let the big, you know, big healthy females go. And just in general, let's say I always tell people now, if I got a, a northern pike fishery and I'm going to harvest a few, let's say three pound pike, but if I happen to catch a 26 inch pike that is exceptionally fat and built like a railroad tie, that's a fast growing, very efficient fish. It's probably going to get real big. It's the kind you want to breed. Even though it's in the slot of fish for that species you would normally keep to eat, you want to let that one go. Just use basic common sense. Be like a farmer. You want to grow good animals and you want Common to- sense? Ain't that common? Yeah, we get cows into this. I can talk just about anything, really. You want to talk beef, corn, whatever it might be, politics. By the way, I, I, I do have a Let's Go Brandon shirt. <laughs> want me to put that on? No, we're, we're good. On, we're, we're all good on that one. But I like I like Mr. Personality Pete, and I can't thank you enough for giving us your time. And you know, maybe one of these trips you come down and do some musky fishing on St. Clair, we can sneak you over and do a little walleye fishing on Erie with me. Yeah, you know that would be fun. That's uh, that, the, the that's offer has been placed. Yeah. yeah, the offer has been placed. Well, I can't thank you enough for giving us your time and. uh we're gonna. We're definitely gonna put a couple of those clips in there. Uh, people that they need to see these things. You know, I mean, for old man winter's sake, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Pete, thanks for giving us your time. Thanks everybody for tuning into the Big Water Podcast. As producer dude will remind us, check us out at BigWaterFishing.com on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Big Water Fishing, and also the podcast is on. What do we got? Spotify, Google, Apple, and what's the last one? Producer dude, Stitcher, and Pete. Stitcher. I think Pete's got something he wants to share. Was... Oh no! I just wanted to say goodbye. Oh, like, right. like this screen. <laughs> uh, you guys, I had fun. <laughs> <laughs>